Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. These familiar words of Jesus serve as a fitting conclusion to Matthew's gospel. Especially that second facet of the disciple-making process, teaching, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. It's a fitting end to Matthew's gospel because Matthew's gospel is structured around Jesus' teachings. There are, as some of you know, five major teaching blocks in Matthew's gospel. We know them maybe as the the five major discourses of Jesus. Uh, The most famous one is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, right? That in that sermon, Jesus reveals what it's like when the kingdom of heaven breaks into time and space, when it begins to shape the way in which we live our lives in the here and now. That it is a major break with the status quo. It is a shocking uh, change from this kind of dog-eat-dog world in which we live. That among other things, Jesus says that we are to turn the other cheek that we are to give generously to all who ask, that we are to pray for those who persecute us, and we are to love even our enemies. In the second and third discourses, Jesus provides guidelines for the first missionary journey, and through parables provides glimpses as to what this kingdom of heaven is really like. And those discourses occupy chapters 10 and 13, respectively. In the fifth discourse, Jesus teaches us about eschatology. He teaches us about the end times. In chapters 24 and 25 of Matthew's Gospel, he, in part, reveals to us what it's going to be like in the last days, that it is going to be a time of great turmoil. And nonetheless... Jesus makes it clear that we are to make the most of the time allotted to us, the most of the gifts entrusted to us, all the while mindful that Jesus will return when we least expect it. You may have noticed that I skipped over the fourth discourse, and I did so on purpose. I saved it for last because today's text, the parable of the unmerciful servant, is part of that fourth discourse. And in this particular discourse, in this particular teaching, Jesus talks about the church. He talks about how it is that we are to live our lives together as his disciples. Among other things, he talks about humility as the way to greatness. He talks about restoring those who have wandered from the faith. And he talks at length about forgiveness, one of the hallmarks of the Christian life and faith. Now, if you think about the 18th chapter of Matthew's gospel, you may recall that Jesus lays out for us this whole process of of how reconciliation, how restoration takes place. that he doesn't pretend as if we, the body of Christ, are never going to have issues with one another. He doesn't pretend that even if we have a Christian spouse or or Christian family members, that we're never going to, to sin against one another, and so he lays out for us this plan of operation, that there might be reconciliation. And what he lays out for us in this plan is that we're always to start with the fewest number, with the smallest number. Jesus says that if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. Unfortunately, though, that's not usually how we operate, is it? 
When someone does something to us or fails to do something for us, we don't go to that person first. We tell just about anybody who will listen. Do you want to know what Donovan did to me? Do you want to know what Cassandra said to me? The nerve of her. And and what we fail to recognize is that the goal is restoration. And as we seek to be reconciled to others, one of the requirements is, is that we safeguard that person's reputation. That it isn't fair to broadcast to other people what he or she has done or failed to do for us. And so Jesus says that if your brother or sister sins against you, go and show him or her, his or her faults just between the two of you. And only if that fails, and it's not one and done, that I went to Sean once, he refuses to repent, he refuses, so I'm done, I'm going to invite others. It is that you continue on that step over an extended period of time until it is clear to you that it's not going to go any further than it has already gone, and it's only then that you invite others into the conversation. And the goal, Jesus says in that moment, is you don't choose people. It's not about ganging up on that person. Yeah, I'm going to bring a little, going to bring uh, Larry and Joey with me, and we're, we're going to settle it up with Sean. It, the goal is to bring somebody or some buddies that that person respects, and the goal is that together that we might move towards a God-pleasing conclusion. And when that has failed after an extended period of time, Jesus says, tell it to the church. But that doesn't mean that we include that in the Sunday announcements. <laughs> Donovan refuses to confess his sin. Please pray for him and encourage him to repent. That would be more than a little awkward. But Jesus does, in that, talk about the importance of the body of Christ. That if there are issues between members of a congregation and they've not been able to to resolve them and even as they've invited other people into the conversation that maybe we expand the circle a little bit more the elders or other trusted members again the goal is reconciliation resolve and only when that too has failed after an extended period of time and multiple attempts jesus said treat them as a tax collector and a sinner That has often been understood as if Jesus were promoting shunning. That if you reach that level, then you are to have absolutely nothing to do with him or her. You are dead to me. But that's not what Jesus is stressing. By so treating someone in that manner, it it brings to bear the seriousness of unconfessed sins. And more than that, it places the burden on the church, upon fellow believers in Jesus, that we are to continue to reach out to that person with the good news of the gospel, recognizing, as the scriptures say, it is the kindness of God that leads all of us to repentance. It's clear from today's text that Peter has been paying attention to Jesus' teaching about forgiveness. And he's now wrestling with how that applies to his own life. And that's what prompts the question. He says, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up up to seven times? And to us, seven doesn't seem like a very lofty number, but it actually more than doubles the number that was practiced in his day and age, according to many of the prominent rabbis, you really only had to forgive somebody three times. If they sinned more than three times against you, especially in the same manner, the understanding was they're not really repentant and therefore you don't really need to forgive them. So here we see that Peter is willing to surpass the practice of his day, but even he imagines that there's some sort of upper limit of forgiveness. And just like him, you and I have much to learn. If you've 
heard sermons in the past on this portion of Matthew 18 or read books, commentaries, and the like. You notice the people are constantly arguing about Jesus' response. Did he say 77 times or 7 times 70? That is 490 times. Quite frankly, it doesn't matter. Because whether it's 77 times or 490 times, Jesus' point is still the same. As someone uh, wrote, if you are still counting the number of times you've forgiven someone, you're not really forgiving, but postponing revenge. I'd say it a little bit, you're just waiting for that person to reach the point of no return, waiting for that person to cross the line of no forgiveness. Unlike some of the stories of grace we've considered in recent weeks, this one's relatively straightforward. It's not difficult to understand. That Jesus' point is clear. It both warns us and encourages us. First, the warning. Jesus summarizes the parable by saying, this is how your heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother, your sister, from the heart. That is a statement that should send a chill down all of our spines and cause all of the hairs on our body to stand up on end. That make no mistake, forgiveness is serious business. And the consequences are eternal in nature. As much as we might like to downplay Jesus' words, he doesn't leave us any wiggle room. There isn't gray area here that can lead to endless speculation. Jesus is quite clear. Forgive or else. Forgive your brother or sister from the heart or else. Or else you won't be forgiven. That statement seems to be at odds with what we hold near and dear, doesn't it? It seems to be at odds with that we are saved by grace apart from works, that we receive forgiveness. It's totally dependent upon what Jesus has done, not what we do for others. And we are, and it is, we are saved by grace alone. And we receive unlimited forgiveness wholly because of what Christ Jesus has done for us. Amen. But, and listen carefully, The fact that we have been saved by grace alone, the fact that we have received unlimited forgiveness on account of what Christ Jesus has done for us is evident in our willingness to forgive others, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ. Think of it in this way, both positively and negatively. Forgiveness extended is evidence of forgiveness received. Forgiveness withheld is evidence of forgiveness despised. And that's what we see in today's parable, that even though this man had been forgiven so much, it didn't touch his heart. And it didn't transform his interactions with others. He received it, maybe not, because he was unwilling to show forth that in his interactions with others. That if we have received forgiveness, it will be evident in our willingness to forgive others. Is it easy to forgive? Absolutely not especially not from the heart. So many of us are are good at giving the appearance of forgiveness. You know, we're we're on the outs with somebody, but when we're together, it's like uh, we just put on that nice face. We we pretend that everything's okay, but in our hearts, we we continue to to nurse and, and harbor anger towards them, 
unforgiveness towards them? Forgiving others, especially from the heart, isn't easy, but hear this well. But it's made possible because we have been forgiven much. And therein lies the power. The scriptures say we love because what? Because God first loved us, and so we forgive much because we have been forgiven much more. In saying that, I'm in no way minimizing the things that other people have done to you and done to me. Some of the things that our brothers and sisters in Christ have done to us have left scars, uh, inwardly and outwardly. And Jesus himself doesn't make light of the things that we do to one another I mean, even as he tells the story uh, that the debt that was incurred is not a small amount. He's not talking about pocket change, a hundred denarii. If, if you understand the, the time and the culture, that that was a denarii was a day's wage. And so you're talking about a hundred days wages, maybe four months worth of your, your pay. That's not a small amount of money. It isn't minor, but Jesus says it is minor in comparison to the debt that has been forgiven. You know this, but I'm going to say it anyway, that when it comes to forgiveness, we cannot be ruled by our feelings. True or false? I mean, if we are ruled by our, our emotions, we likely won't forgive the hurtful, even horrific things that other people have done to us. It's just that simple. And that's why forgiveness is first and foremost a decision. It's a conscious decision we make, and perhaps we make it again and again and again and again, depending upon the particular sins. It's a conscious decision that's made possible, again, because we have been forgiven much. If we can raise the screen, please, Micah. I would like for you to just take a few minutes to fix your eyes on the cross. And as you fix your eyes on the cross to know that your debt and my debt was canceled. Personally, I'd hate to know what my debt was. <laughs> I'm sure it's far larger than I could even imagine. And I'm sure the same is true for you. But for you to know that on the cross, because of his pity, because of his great compassion for you, Jesus canceled your debt in full. He didn't say, I'll give you an extension. I'll be a bit patient with you. I'll give you a little longer to repay. He didn't say, I'm going to cut it in half and make it a little easier for you to repay. But watch this and hear this, is that Jesus canceled our debt to the very last penny. And speaking of pennies, I, I have something for you this morning. Something that I hope you'll actually keep. Something that drives home the point of Jesus' parable. It's, it's a penny, actually, it's a Jesus penny. Didn't know they existed, but there are, this is a Jesus penny. And this penny is to remind you that your debt, no matter how great it was, has been canceled to the very last penny. I'm going to invite you to come up in just a moment and, and get your Jesus penny. And when you, when you get it, you'll notice that it actually has a cross that's been cut into it. And that's how you and I are to view each other. 
through the cross of Christ. Because if we only look at each other in light of what we've done or failed to do, we likely will be slow to forgive, perhaps unwilling to forgive. But as we look at one another through what Christ Jesus has done for us, then we are enabled and empowered to forgive, not counting the cost, not remembering how many times we've forgiven in the past, that in Christ Jesus, because we have received unlimited forgiveness, we in turn are able to forgive without limit. As you come forward on, on your own, I, I would encourage you to do one thing. When, when you get your penny, is maybe just go to one side or the other f- for just a moment and, and pause uh, to thank God the Father for his unlimited grace for you in Christ Jesus and his unlimited grace through you in Christ Jesus. You can come get your pennies.
Lord Jesus, there is nothing that is hidden from you. You know all the scars that we bear on the inside and the outside, caused by the hands, the actions, the words of others. And there are some things that we feel so justified in not forgiving and continuing to hold on to grudges, nursing our animosity towards others. But ultimately, that does us no good and doesn't do that individual any good. And in some way, cuts us off from the grace and forgiveness that you so freely give. So help us not to be held captive by what others have done or failed to do for us, but help us to live out who we are in you, that we are God's chosen people, wholly loved, Enable us to clothe ourselves with humility and compassion and kindness. Enable us to, to bear with one another, forgiving whatever grievances we have against each other. Enable us to forgive as you have forgiven us. And having forgiven us without limits, enable us to forgive others, likewise without limits. We pray these things, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen. I invite you to stand and respond with us uh, this morning in song. We're going to sing two songs together and by green and praise. The first is, will be new to many of you, so I invite you to just listen at first, and then. but we will agree in saying what a beautiful...